tell me who it is you are, please? Pauline, Pauline McHugh, Nee Hayden, um, his oh. third, fourth child, don't I? Okay. Yes, fourth child, his daughter. Okay, and could you tell me who you are and how you're related? I am May Lally now, yeah. I was May McHugh, and I was the second in the family. Sure. Okay, and do you want to say who you are and how you're related? Uh, I'm Morris McHugh. Uh, they christened me Pichelli after the Pope Pius because he was elected that year. <laughs> That's Pichelli. And uh, I was born in 1939. And I was the baby of the family. <laughs> Patrick McHugh was born in 1894 in Dundalk, County Louth. He was reared in Inneskeen. He lived in well, Dundalk. He went, he went to the Friary School. Mm -hmm. He lived in Vincent Avenue. Sure. Uh, you were yeah, he was in the, the family were very uh, organised. They were Republicans, really. Yeah. Uh, from day one, as I said, they were from Monaghan hmm. and uh, they were fluent Irish speakers. Sure. And. Uh, if they wanted to keep any secrets from the family, they'd speak in Irish to each other. And that's the way they kept the, the secrets away from them. But my father, because of, of the family relationship there, the uh, Republicans, that's how he became a uh, Republican yeah. really. Yeah. His father was a nationalist, but his mother was even more so a patriot. Both were musical. And he was reared on Irish folk music and song. At 16, he became a member of the Sinn Féin party and a monitor in the Friary National School. That's no problem. I think he wanted to become a teacher, is that right? That's or? right, he yes. did become a teacher, did, to take yeah. all the British rules down off the school walls. In 1911, Countess Markovic delivered a lecture on the Manchester Martyrs at a commemoration concert. Paddy McHugh had the honour and pleasure of a long chat with her in the hall in Bachelor's Walk the result being the start of Fina Erin in Dundalk. He was forced by the manager of the school to choose between teaching as a profession and Fina Erin, which Paddy McHugh had started in Dundalk in 1911. McHugh chose the Fina, and he became an apprentice fitter in the Great Northern Railway on the 1st of January, 1912. Concerts and lectures were organised to commemorate the Manchester Martyrs and Robert Emmett in Dundalk. He has mentioned that in 1910, Paddy Hughes had led a small band of men, 10 of them, to oppose and obstruct the proclamation of George V as King of England and Ireland. The event took place from the steps of the courthouse with the square in front surrounded by strong forces of armed military and RIC. The 10 men took up position on the ground flagstones of the 1798 monument facing the courthouse and continuously interrupted the sheriff by singing patriotic songs and shouting to hell with the king, etc, etc, and denying the sheriff's right to proclaim George as our king. They were threatened by the RIC and military to, be, to withdraw or be removed by force. Things got so bad the sheriff interrupted his reading of the King's proclamation to read the Riot Act to legalise the order he had decided to give to remove opposition. Having done so, the RIC were ordered to fix bayonets, but the charge never took place. Explanations given was that the men were standing on private property and could not be removed. When the Union Jack was hoisted in the town, one of the protesters put a ladder against the monument, hoisted the only Irish flag they had, the green one with the harp, and proclaimed the Irish Republic. And this was in 1910. This scene had such an impact on Paddy McHugh that he had joined the Sinn Féin party that week. Yeah. And uh, they started off a Sinn Féin party, as far as I know, Sinn Féin party. Uh, I was only about 16 at the time, and I hired a hall, and, and that's how I started off. And they were under derision by all of the, the local people okay. for starting the, the Sinn Féin organisation, the club. Yeah. That, that's how that's they right. started. They had their meetings in the hall, and they made all sorts of uh, 
sort of raffles and stuff to get money together, you know? Okay. okay. Well, he was a very studious person and uh, very intelligent, as I said, and he was a mathematician, yeah. as well as uh, I think that one time he, he had intended to, to become a teacher. Sure. But uh, because of his views and because he had joined Sinn Féin, I don't think that the schools really wanted him there, you know. So, mm -hmm. so then, as far as I know, he joined the Great Northern Railway yeah. uh, and became used to working with uh, metals and stuff like that at the Great Northern Railway. Sure. And that's, that's what uh, led him onto this engineering of, of uh, munitions and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Um, do you want to mention about Patrick McHugh's sisters, though? Celia and Bridget and Celia McHugh mm -hmm. were coming them on. In the dock. In the dock, yeah. Patrick McHugh has mentioned in his witness statement that when Major John McBride had visited the dock in 1913, he delivered a lecture on the Irish volunteers and their formation, and that McHugh learned an awful lot from his conversation with him. He also mentions Sean McDermott visited Dundalk in March 1916, and he left no doubt as to the 1916 objective. Uh, what did you think of maybe why he went out in 1916? Oh, well, the only reason yeah. he went out was the same as I was to take the British rules off the school walls. So, oh. Even to, before he died, even he couldn't stand the British. Yeah. That was it. You know? Okay. Uh, Although he did work with the Englishmen. Yeah. Poland, he did. He did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did work. I think a lot of people, though, it wasn't necessarily like civilians, but it was more the Empire. That's or the, it, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah the uh, there was the Consul McGee. Do you want to talk about that's that? That's right, or? yeah. yeah. Consul McGee that had been shot. Did the, the police man? Oh, yeah, or? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he, was, he was accused of shooting that man, but he swore, he swore he never did it. that he did not do it. Yeah. That was one thing. And I say that for him. He was a very honest mm. person. Yeah, yeah. You know. Okay. When all the men had gone home, Donald O'Hannigan, Paddy Hughes, and myself, each of us aware at this time that we had been charged with the shooting at Castle Bellingham and that there was a charge of murder against us, which we must face if arrested. As we would not give ourselves up, it was decided to evade arrest. On the following Sunday, I went to Mass in Dunboyne and on the Tuesday following, the RIC raided Mullally's and interrogated me. They were very suspicious and mentioned that I answered the description of a fellow wanted for shitting police. I was posing as a tramp fiddler. They also mentioned I was in bad company at Mullally's, hence their suspicions of me. It must have been my retorts on Mullally's behalf that allayed their suspicions then. I remained there that night and next morning I set out for Dublin. RIC arriving to arrest me shortly after I had left. I don't know. I know he came to Dublin all right, mm. but he was on the run mm. from the Black and Tans, you know, that much. And uh, they had a price on his head. Mm. And from that, he started thinking about around the country fiddling, mm. playing his music. But they never found him. They never got him. So mm. then I think after that, he got married. Did they got married up in got married in got Newry Newry. Newry. They got married up in Newry Cathedral. He sure. was afraid to come back to Dunlow. I contacted Father Costello of the Dominican Order, with whom I had been very friendly in Dundalk. This is from his friary connection. He put me in touch with Brother Joaquin, a grand Irish man and Republican. I assumed the name of John Kiernan, which was the name of an RIC sergeant who swore I did the shooting at Castle Bellingham. Brother Joaquim took me under his protection. I had a free run of St. Saviour's house and anyone I wished to meet, I could safely do so there. Later, I made full use of this concession and met my family and relatives many times in that house. Visitors to me entered the house from the Dorset Street entrance while I always entered and left at the back in Granby Lane. I had to keep low and quiet as RIC from Dundalk were constantly in the city on the lookout. Brother Joaquim was my intelligence officer. He visited me frequently and kept me posted. At one time in 1917, it looked as if the RIC were hot on the scent 
and brother Joaquin had arranged with Michael Collins that I be moved to America. He told me of the arrangements and asked me if I would go. I thanked him and Michael Collins for their interest, but said I preferred to remain at home until I was forced out. I avoided the main thoroughfare of the city, and whenever I went to St. Saviour's, I kept off the beaten tracks, so I never ran into anyone who might know me. He couldn't go back to Dundalk or he would have been. His mother died in the meantime. I think the mother died around it was 1918 yeah. or that. But he couldn't come back to Dundalk for yeah. the funeral. 1918 brought the armistice. And I was one of a party defending number six Harcourt Street from Trinity Boys attack. I was on duty at the Sinn Féin Ardèche and also at the first stall. And at this time I was unemployed. All this time, my name appeared in police hue and cry, wanted for murder, but I found that one was safer in the crowd than alone, so I was now working openly. The Dublin Brigade was looking for a good fitter and a reliable man for munitions work. At my request, Tom informed Michael Lynch, brigade officer in charge, that I was idle and would consider myself honoured to be on such a job. I then felt that if I was caught doing something more than the charge already against me, that the punishment could not be increased, and I would have obtained great satisfaction. I was known to Michael Lynch, and he agreed to appoint me to Brigade Council, if Brigade Council was satisfied. He placed the matter before the Council meeting, Michael Collins being present. I was unknown to other officers, but on Collins hearing that my real name was McHugh, he recommended me to the Brigadier and I was appointed to the position. Thus, in February 1919, I was transferred from C Company 3rd Battalion to Brigade Munitions. To be relieved of all other company duties, my whole time to be employed on munitions. Very intelligent and uh, uh, very a mathematician as well as an engineer. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he was brilliant and all that sort of thing. And uh, we had samples of uh, hand grenades they made yeah. at home in the house, really, yeah. and the moulds and where they where they set them up, and um, all of the uh, uh, material they used was, was scrap metal, and they'd have to melt it down, smelt it down, and they used coke uh, in a furnace, and they had them um, under a bicycle shop in Parnell Street. Yeah. They had uh, on the meat in the basement. They had this fire going and they used to smelt the iron there and they set the balls up and uh, they made grenades and had the, the striking pins. Now the, the grenades were made of gun metal if you like yeah. and uh, the striking pin was made of brass which is easier to work on yeah. and had a firing pin on it. And the actual bomb itself was filled with jelly knife, believe it or believe it or not. It's, how do you explode? Yeah, it's very dangerous to use as well. Yeah. And apart from that, the RIC used to come in and have the bicycles repaired in the shop. Yeah. And the boys down below were making these grenades. You know, they never caught them. The smoke was building up. It was to fill uh, Parnell Street with smoke. Yeah. All that sort of thing. And they raided a couple of times, but they were they had never a really bike, caught. They had a bicycle up in the shop. Yeah, and yeah. the fellows used to cycle it, and the li a light, the light dance under the ammunition where they're making the ammunition, the light would flicker. Really? And they knew the RIC were upstairs, or wherever they were. That's right, that was a signal. Wow, yeah. it was so important. As members of the staff, we were expected to avoid anything that might draw attention to ourselves and thereby endanger the factory. Those engaged on munition work when I joined the staff in February 1919 were Michael Lynch, Matt Furlong, who was later killed in County Mead when testing a trench mortar, Tom Young, who was a moulder, Sean O'Sullivan, case making, Tom Q, filling, Christopher O'Reilly, the boy in the cycle shop, Joseph Lawless and Archie Heron, tenants of premises 198 Parnell Street. The amount of cycle business done was very small, could easily cope with repairs and inquiries. The filling of Parnell Street with a white cloud became so regularly a weekly occurrence that no one ever took any notice of it, only to say Heron and Lawless's are working and no one ever attempted to send for a fire brigade 
on seeing Cloud leaving the basement. Our cure for fumes was the drink of milk after casting, which counteracted the effects of fumes on the person. The grenade, when made, was for use in Dublin. The shell was no larger than a large duck egg and with firing neck attached could be covered by a normal hand. On two occasions in 1920, our monotony was relieved by a visit from G Division. Due perhaps to the white cloud that weakly wiped out Parnell Street, the G Division must have become curious as to what was going on. They therefore arrived in force one day and examined the premises thoroughly. Their steps entering the shop were audible to us in the basement and they were so numerous that we immediately suspected it was something unusual. We set to clear all trace of our work. Grenade shells were dumped and molds ready for casting broken up. This work was progressing according to plan when the danger signal was received. In October 1920, the mortar was ready for trial. The site was selected in County Mead and on a Sunday in mid-October, Matt Furlong, Patter Clancy, Tom Young, Sean O'Sullivan and myself proceeded to the trial ground. First, a number of dummy shells were fired. Matt Furlong, of course, was operator at all times. Thus, when we came to fire the live shell, there was a muffled explosion and a rush of air around me with the swish of passing shrapnel in the air. I turned around. The gun had disappeared and Matt was lying on the ground. I ran to him, poor fellow. And although not killed, the whole left side of his body was a frightful sight. His left foot was practically severed from his leg and was lying at right angles to it when I reached him. He was fully conscious and his first question to me was, is the gun all right? I assured him it was. Number 198 Parnell Street was in deep sorrow that day. Padder Clancy arrived and told us that Matt Furlong had his left leg amputated and there was a chance of recovery. He asked me to meet him at four o'clock at Republican Outfitters, Talbot Street, to go to the hospital to see Matt. I arrived at Talbot Street on time and in time for the raid in which Sean Tracy was killed on the footpath outside the shop. On entering the shop, I noticed a few suspicious characters outside, one being actually at the window. I told those inside, Dick McKee, Joe Vice, Sean Tracy, Cruz, etc., that I thought the shop was being watched. Padder Clancy's assistant told me I was to wait for Padder. I offered to leave the shop while those inside could see from behind the curtain what action the fellow standing at the window would take as I passed him towards the pillar intending to return immediately to meet Patter. I had just reached the pork butcher shop next to Clancy's when a military lorry met me and halted outside the Republican Outfitters. Soldiers jumped out and almost immediately the firing started. I saw Sean fall. I proceeded towards that pillar and stood at the corner of Earl Street watching all that was going on. And after a time to my amazement, I was joined by Dick McKee who had escaped during the turmoil. I told Dick my business and he said, come on up to the Matter Hospital. There's great activity around there and I am expecting an ambush there. We'll go up and see how things are going on. He told me Matt was dead and police and military were looking for Dan Breen. Patter Clancy next introduced to me drawings of a small submachine gun of German origin to report on the possibility of manufacturing the same. After careful examination of drawings and detailing machines necessary for its production, I told Patter Clancy it was possible to do so, but not in present premises or with present plant. During the preparation of the agreement, Patter Clancy was arrested in Fitzpatrick's and murdered in Dublin Castle. Thus, he was with us barely two months, but great progress had been made in that time. On learning of Patter's death, I went to headquarters for orders as to whether premises should be closed for a time or that we carry on. The Adjutant General, Gerardo Sullivan, 
then gave me an order to carry on and fight. He told me where to obtain sidearms from members of staff and devise any plan I thought fit for defense of premises. A week or so later, December 1920, on an indiscriminate night raid on dwellings over 198 Parnell Street shop, the auxiliaries accidentally discovered our one and only working munitions factory. Headquarters was without a factory, but had numbers one and two Luke Street. The submachine gun was forgotten, and the order from the Quartermaster General was to get going as soon as possible again on grenades. On the Friday previous to the signing of the treaty, Richard Mulcahy inspected factories for the first time. I met him at Luke Street and was introduced to Sean Russell. He questioned me generally on work and asked what precautions were being taken. I told him none as we were working under truce conditions. He told me I should immediately return to war conditions as it was expected that negotiations would break down on the allegiance question. I said I would do so and was again on a war footing when the signing of the treaty was announced. Our years of hardship and worry to me had been in vain. I had my mind made up and so had Sean Russell. I would never give my allegiance to a British king or have anyone do so on my behalf. When the four courts were attacked, I had 2,000 grenades complete, which I sent by road to Dublin Brigade. During the occupation of the four courts, I was recalled to Dublin to set up plant there. This I did, and bombs and mines were produced in the four courts during its occupation. Mum used to say he was, went to Cork, he was in Cork for a while. In Cork, I was on my own and had not to refer to headquarters as to what I should do. So I set out to complete the job on which Matt Furlong died. Liam Lynch, accompanied by Todd Andrews, arrived and attended a divisional meeting at Sean Moynihan's house. State forces under Sean Hales had a lively time and had to fight a good bit of way in taking Bali Nakira. I had sent complete plans of gun and shell to Dublin and I learned later that one was actually made the ceasefire preventing its use. After the ceasefire, I dismantled the plant and dumped everything. It would have given me far greater satisfaction for to be truthful, I must say I got no kick out of opposing my own countrymen, but felt ashamed to think we were such fools to allow our ancient enemy to divide us. I have no personal regrets, but I regret sincerely that the politicians of Ireland cannot find some means of wiping out that regrettable period of our history from their minds and find some way of fulfilling the declaration they made when they joined the Irish Volunteers in 1913 to fight for the liberties common to the people of Ireland. I think Daddy used to go around the country playing the fiddle. That's yeah. what I didn't know him. Okay. He was a fiddler going around the country. Any friendships with his friends? They were in 1960. He did. Yeah. One chap mentioned there. We were young. Uh, Donnelly. What was his name? Oh, Mick Donnelly. Mick yeah. Donnelly. Mick Donnelly. Yeah, Mick Donnelly. Okay. He was a great one. friend of his. I actually yeah. think he's mentioned the original dispatches there. Yeah. yeah. And Mick Donnelly, I remember, used to come to the house yeah. to write this. With the state, oh, right, okay. and helped him along with it, you know. Oh, very good, yeah. Start, start out the ground and stuff like that, you yeah, know? yeah. But then I think he was in the LDF, I think that's right, the joined, forces. Yeah. Oh, he joined right, so right. that, yeah, yeah. And after that, and uh, he was a sergeant in, in the LDF. And I think in 1945, I think it was, it was in the uh, the tattoo, the Irish Army tattoo right, in, the in the RDS, in the RDS, oh, and he was in charge of munitions section there that had all sorts of stuff there. Sean, Sean's uh, uh, hand grenades that he made first himself that were there. Yeah. Samples of that, you know. And, the, uh, and I got sixpence for polishing the buttons on his uniform. 
I remember uh, I was only a kid at the time when De Valera came to the door hmm. because they're both on the same side at that time, anti anti treaty, you know. Hmm. And uh, when De Valera, and he was trying to persuade him to to join with Philip Fall at the time, hmm. my father turned it down and said no. Okay. He wouldn't go. I remember that. <laughs> Would well, you know why you're at all or not? Or? No, as he said, what he went out to fight for. Oh yeah, it he wasn't didn't for fight yeah. Yeah. to get into the doll or fight for money. He didn't fight for any of that. Mm. He didn't fight for position. Sure, sure. He just went out to fight against what was happening in the country. Mm. That was his idea. But all the others got are in. Were all ended up in the government. Yeah. But, okay. But Is then, it, when he yeah. was in Dublin, he was involved with the Fianna Fáil coming. He was involved very much with that. Well, actually, it was with Sean McEntee, but mm. as far as Sean McEntee and myself were only friends, mm. I mean, they were together on the walk from Castle Bellingham. Yeah. And Punches, was Punch McNeese accused uh, McEntee of not being near the Rising at Easter Sunday. Uh, and, yeah. Um... And he came to our house to get the synopsis of Father's papers. He had, Daddy had this case which was up in the attic. Yeah. Full of papers, so he yeah. got that, and that's why. He, he had all that printed out for us. So Daddy could have been in Dáil Éireann with McEntee, yeah. but he swore no, that's not what he went out to fight for. Okay. He went out to get rid of the British rule. Okay. That's what he went out for. So, I mean, even the day of his funeral, mm. we weren't allowed to sit at the top of the church. Really? Because the dignity were coming. And we had to sit beside the mortuary. Do you not remember that? I don't remember Oh, that I remember that so well. And all the TDs and whoever, whoever he knew or that knew him, yeah. sat up at the top of the church. And we were left sitting on the side. When was that? 19, died 1957. 1957. Okay. So for a certain lot of people, but not everybody's included in it. Mm. You know, they haven't gone back through all the people that fought in 1916 mm. in Ireland. They haven't even looked. Mm. But anyone that's of any main or anything, they're included. Mm. That's it. Okay. I mean, nobody ever came to us and said, "Was your father out in 1916?" Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. just went to the top, and that was it. Mm. I mean, even to hear them on the television. Yeah. Discussing 1916, half don't don't know what they're talking about. You know? Yeah. And I remember yeah. when, he, when he became ill that time with, with his chest, I remember my, my mother saying, you know how he got that? He got that <laughs> fight in the trenches. <laughs> behind me has been on Cambrassa Street since 1956, the 40th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. In 1956, it was loud 1916 volunteer Paddy McHugh who gave a speech before the original plaque unveiling right here. They left this hall on Easter Sunday, as it says in the original plaque. 
This new plaque unveils the day of the John Boyle O'Reilly Society is a poignant and fitting tribute to the late volunteers. The John Boyle O'Reilly POH building's historical significance has now been suitably remembered and should not be forgotten.